or should I say good evening? Buenas noches. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. I don't know how well you're going to be able to hear us. It's a little loud in here. Uh, we're going to have a uh, four-part discussion on virtual reality and the markets and the opportunities. And um, hopefully we're going to get it done quickly enough that there'll be time for some questions. And I'm going to have my colleague Manuel uh, do a Spanish translation. So we're going to go back and forth. I'll say something, he'll say something, so forth and so on. Hopefully that'll make sure everybody understands what we're talking about. So real quickly, uh, John Petty Research, we do market research as the title suggests. We work with the leading uh, uh, technological companies that are involved in virtual reality. We advise various uh, conferences and we're here at this one. Uh, we are here at this one because of uh, Immersive Technologies uh, Asci uh, Alliance and uh, they're the ones who helped organize this uh, particular uh, portion of the event. And the uh, ITA is an organization that uh, is an industrial organization for the companies who are making the content, making the hardware, and making all the peripherals. So you probably won't know a whole lot about them, but I advise you to put them in the forefront of your head because uh, they will be introducing information that you'll find useful. Okay. Eh, vamos a estar traduciendo en forma eh, alternativa eh, lo que es la parte de inglés y español. Eh, John Pedi ahora me acaba de dar la, la palabra. John Pedi eh, tiene una empresa que se llama Pedi Research y que tiene eh, diferentes actividades, como por ejemplo análisis de la industria y hacer una serie de reportes de mercados diferentes como video game, como realidad virtual, entre otros. So, so the question is, why, why are you here? Um, although it's a pretty great place to be at. <laughs> this is a really exciting conference. Um, we'll give you a little bit of information on the market forecasts, some definitions, just so we're all uh, speaking the same language, which sounds a little funny to say. Uh, some of the challenges and uh, who are the players. Uh, screwed up. Do it again. Okay. Uh, Real quick definitions, you probably already know most of these terms. <laughs> what, what's an HMD, head mounted display, field of view, that's how wide a view that you can see in your peripheral area. Uh, fovea, that's the center most uh, active part of your eye, that's where we look at most of the time, then you have the periphery. Uh, interactive, interactive is when we are doing something and we get a reaction to it like you would in a game. Uh, versus passive, which is typically 360 degree video where you're just looking at stuff, interesting stuff, but you're not able to interact with it. And latency, latency is probably one of the most used terms in virtual reality because it's the thing that will make you sick. And basically it's when I pull a trigger or move or do something, I want the image that I'm looking at to be in synchronization with me and how long it takes to get in synchronization with me is called the latency. And if the latency is too long, and I look here, and then the image comes, I start to not feel so good. So it's a very, very important aspect. Bien, en esta discusión que vamos a tener aquí entre nosotros tres, vamos a tomar los diferentes temas, por ejemplo, eh, lo que es un head mounted display, cuáles son las características que hacen a un head mounted display diferente de otro. En el caso, por ejemplo, tenemos el campo de visión, el field of view, que es cuántos grados podemos visualizar en un head mounted display. También tenemos la fovea, que es el centro de la, de la imagen, donde se ve más nítida. Y también tenemos la parte interactiva, ¿no? que podemos reaccionar en 360 grados, pero muy importante con la latencia, que la latencia sea suficientemente rápida o baja para que podamos responder rápidamente a la interacción con el usuario. So um, I wanted to caution you about some of the uh, market data that is spilling out onto the web. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of different forecasts as to how large the market's going to be, how many millions of units or how many billions of dollars and so forth. And the problem is that that data is free data that is being used as an enticement to sell a report. And so what you're lacking in that free data is definition is the what's behind it. And that's a critical because if you don't know what was used to create those numbers, then those numbers are pretty much meaningless. 
And so I caution you to not get too excited when you see those numbers, unless you have an opportunity to dig into who made them and why they made them and what was their source of information. Bien, como podemos ver en las estadísticas, el mercado, los números que se están arrojando recientemente son muy altos, donde tenemos diferentes tipos de head mounted displays que se van a vender alrededor del mundo en los próximos años y que también eh, vemos que hay una curva de adopción muy grande, el mercado claramente está dirigido hacia realidad virtual y vamos a tener cada vez más y más participación, ya hay empresas muy grandes que están participando en realidad virtual, simplemente en lo que va del año 2016, eh, tenemos 9.6 millones de unidades pronosticadas para venta de head mounted displays de realidad virtual. Así con todas las estadísticas, pero hay que tener mucho énfasis en que todos estos números son empezando, estamos empezando esta curva de adopción, no son los números finales, pero se, se tiene un forecast o una previsión que el número de unidades va a ser altísimo. So, um... Just like opinions, uh, everybody has a nose. You're going to hear a lot of opinions about what the market's all about. The momentum is already started. And I think, you know, we can thank Facebook. If it wasn't for Facebook, none of us would be here. Um, Lucky was doing interesting stuff, but he was just a small guy doing stuff. But it was Facebook that lit up the industry to saying, hey, VR is something real. And, and, and look where it's gotten us. Um, those numbers are counting what we call the low-hanging fruit. We think the market could actually be much, much larger, and especially in mobile VR. Bien, eh, aquí como sabemos, bueno, siempre vamos a tener diferentes números dependiendo de la fuente. Hay muchas fuentes de información, y eh, lo que es importante saber es que estamos viendo este momentum crecer por parte de la industria de realidad virtual. O sea, ya es incontenible. Ya. Facebook fue quien originó prácticamente todo este movimiento con la compra de Oculus en 2 billones de dólares y claramente esa apuesta hizo que otras empresas junto con Samsung Gear VR, este, eh, Oculus, eh, las empresas como PlayStation VR y otras más empezaran a generar ya eh, inversiones considerables en la parte de realidad virtual. Todos estos nombres pues van hacia arriba, ¿no? So I told you not to trust any numbers that you get for free. Um, these are not numbers that are publicly released. You did pay for them because you're here, so you had to pay money to get here. So here's some data, and the point I wanted to show here, and I, I believe you guys get a copy of all these slides, I'm not certain, but if you don't, just send us an email, we answer all of our emails. And it's a little hard to see, I apologize for that, but maybe you can see what we put into some of the categories and, 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 <laughs> and try and scale it off. Uh, it can get to 40 million units by 2020, And uh, I think that's the exciting part. And, and we are conservative forecasters, so this could even be much higher. Bien, aquí podemos ver el forecast año con año conservador de las diferentes participaciones de head mounted displays de la industria, donde nos damos cuenta que hay una tendencia claramente de crecimiento. Son números muy conservadores, pero aún así son números muy interesantes. Ya cuando multiplicamos todo esto por el, el monto, los precios, los costos y el número de, adop de adopters que van a irse acumulando año con año, el número ya se convierte en algo interesante. A couple of other definitions that you should have in your hip pocket, in your heart, so to speak, is the difference between tethered and untethered. Uh, the tethered units are the units that typically have dedicated displays, and Oculus and HTC and some products that this gentleman makes are uh, in that category. Uh, they have cables behind them, they have, you know, restricted as to how far you can go. They're usually very expensive, but they also have very high resolution and very fast response times because they're driven by a big PC. Uh, untethered are the things like Samsung gear or uh, car cardboard. Uh, the untethered ones will be used in location-based entertainment like roller coasters and things of that nature. Obviously, you can't have wires and they will be passive uh, uh, experiences. You'll only be able to look as you're going on a roller coaster. Uh, there's a consumer in-home uh, virtual reality, which will be primarily tethered units, uh, like PC gaming. Uh, they'll be out of home, which is, the, again, the roller coaster example. And then there's the category, which was actually the fuel and the foundation for virtual reality, which is the military and scientific, where they've been using virtual reality for a long time and funding a lot of, maybe most of the research that's going into virtual reality. Bien, eh, tenemos que hay muchas definiciones dentro del mercado. Por ejemplo, se conoce el tethered y el untethered. Quiere decir que están conectados con un cable o son wireless. 
el caso de los Tether es cuando estás conectado a tu computadora a través del HDMI o algún otro tipo de cable, el DisplayPort. Y por otro lado tenemos los que son on Tether, que son los eh, dispositivos eh, como móviles o que están basados en una conexión inalámbrica, sobre todo para experiencias móviles. También tenemos entretenimiento dentro de la casa, que es el Consumer in Home, y tenemos el entretenimiento fuera de la casa, que es el Out of Home Entertainment. Y obviamente la parte militar y profesional, que es de donde se surgió y donde se generó toda esta parte de realidad virtual en sus inicios. So, what are the markets that will use virtual reality? Um, there's a friend of mine at AMD, and he has an expression. He says, uh, "Virtual reality is not going to be a big market; it's going to be all markets," and that's correct. Uh, you can think about virtual reality as being like electricity, in that it's just going to be everywhere in every part of our lives. And so these are just a few of the applications that we can easily identify that are already using it and will continue to use it. New ones will appear almost every week. Como podemos imaginar, las aplicaciones de realidad virtual son prácticamente infinitas. Para cualquier tipo de aplicación como militar, médica, automotriz, de medios, de diferentes artes, de entretenimiento, todo este tipo de aplicaciones y muchas más se pueden utilizar en realidad virtual. Prácticamente podemos poner al usuario en cualquier parte del mundo, en cualquier ubicación, en cualquier escenario, exista o no exista, y tenemos la facilidad de meterlo y transportarlo a ese lugar. Now, there's some other things that you should have be aware of, especially if you're here uh, with career opportunities in mind, and that is that there are already 12 companies building tethered headsets, and 61, and that data is probably wrong because it was 61 as of last week, and I haven't updated it lately uh, for a week, but there's 61 companies making the uh, untethered ones. There's 45 VR studios that are declared 45. We think that'll grow to 100 very, very quickly before the end of the year. There's already three operating systems, and there's a talk of a fourth specialized virtual reality operating system. So my message here is, uh, if you're out looking for a job, I would advise you to not go to a startup that's doing a head-mounted display. Go to one of the biggest ones if you want to be in hardware. Uh, or, or develop your own application. Bien, como podemos ver, eh, hay un mercado interesante donde hay diferentes productores de head mounted displays, más de 12. Tenemos también diferentes head mounted displays que son on tether. Tenemos ya una serie, una cantidad importante de, de empresas que están eh, en este sector, en este mercado. Estudios que están desarrollando experiencias de realidad virtual y también hay que cumplir con diferentes sistemas operativos como Windows, Mac, Android, OS. Y claramente habrá saturaciones, si van a empezar alguna empresa, eh, pueden pensar en que habrá que dedicarse en aquellos que tengan un rango de oportunidad. So, VR is still emerging a, a medium. Uh, the rules are fluid uh, in that there are no rules. The only rule we have right now is higher resolution, wider field of view, shorter latency. That's, that's our only guidelines right now, really. Uh, the language is evolving. We, we don't really understand all of this yet. Uh, the content creation workflow, it requires new tools and new thinking. Kathleen is going to speak about that a little bit. Uh, the repurposing of contents like existing games and so forth, that's been pretty much proven to not work very well. Yes, you can get the uh, virtual reality uh, environment created, but it wasn't designed for virtual reality, and so you're going to get artifacts and you're going to get latencies, and it's just, you know, it's, it's a retrofit, so it doesn't work too well. And this is where you can find some jobs and where you can find some information for jobs. Okay. Um, aquí tienen algunos links de importancia por si están interesados en lo referente a, a jobs o trabajos y, y fuentes de empleo. And ahora voy a pasar a eh, hacer una presentación, voy a desconectar eh, el HDMI eh, y voy a conectar mi laptop. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks so much, John.
That was John from Pe John Petty from Petty Research, and he was talking about all these industry insights that bring along uh, different uh, numbers and statistics and numbers that provide uh, insights and information about the industry. Ese fue John Petty de Petty Research que nos hizo favor de traernos información estadística, números concretos y estadísticos que hablan acerca de las oportunidades de realidad virtual en este momento. Eh, aquí en este momento. Oh. Eh, voy a hablarles un poco muy rápido acerca de nuestra empresa Immersion Brelia, eh, que es la, la, la empresa que represento. También voy a hablar de los retos, como eh, bien lo, lo mencionó John, hay una serie de retos. Y después voy a hablar de los factores que son clave para la adopción masiva de realidad virtual. Y voy a estar intercambiando un poco de información con ellos y con Caitlin para que nos haga favor de enriquecer la, la presentación. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the different uh, backgrounds of our company. Where do we come from? I'm, I am Mexican. And I'm proud to be Mexican. I, I was born and raised uh, in Mexico. I was actually studying and raised here in Guadalajara. So I'm very proud to be here today. And uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges and I'm going to talk about the key factors for mass adoption. Okay, so really quick, I'm going to go over this uh, slide. Um, we started in a company here in Guadalajara called T Division, Three Dimensional Vision. We started the company with the idea to bring 3D to the masses back in 1999. Then we started uh, developing our prototypes and then we moved to Irvine, California. We standardized the 3D Blu ray player format and then we worked with the military, we worked with uh, the Pentagon, NASA, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, many other companies and um, we standardized all these platforms for stereoscopic, three-dimensional, including the 3D Blu-ray. Eh, como parte de nuestra compañía, yo les, les comentaba, yo soy nacido aquí en México y crecí aquí en Guadalajara. Muy orgulloso de estar aquí en Campus Party viendo este movimiento tecnológico fascinante. Y eh, nuestra historia empezó en Guadalajara precisamente en el año 99, cuando hicimos nuestra primera empresa de tercera dimensión que posteriormente se convirtió en el estándar del Blu-ray 3D. Tuvimos la fortuna de que nuestros patentes se convirtieron en el estándar. Empezamos a trabajar con empresas muy grandes como la NASA, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman y otras más, el Pentágono también. Y eh, a partir de eso, lo que hicimos fue volcar toda nuestra experiencia en una empresa que se llama Immersion Brelia, eh, para vaciar todo este conocimiento que aprendimos desde el 2003 hasta el día de hoy para poder llevar realidad virtual y tercera dimensión a toda la gente. Uh, so we use and leverage all our expertise to bring the technology to the mass market. Uh, there are many challenges in the virtual reality ecosystem like John mentioned. So the challenges are the standardization. We're going to be talking about that in, de in detail. The camera quality or the acquisition process. The content generation as well as the deployment platforms. And finally, what is the visualization devices that we have? Voy a hablarles un poco muy rápido acerca de los diferentes retos de la estandarización que hay que hacer en realidad virtual como un nuevo medio que mencionó John Petty. Eh, es un nuevo medio, requiere métodos diferentes, nuevas técnicas y eh, tenemos que tomar en cuenta todos estos factores. Hay partes que se tienen que estandarizar, hay partes que requieren de que la calidad de la cámara sea eh, suficiente, que la, el, con, la contribución de contenido sea la adecuada para poder tener más y más y más contenido normalmente así como las plataformas que se utilizan para desplegar el contenido y finalmente cómo se va a visualizar el contenido de realidad virtual. Acerca de estandarización, hay algunas iniciativas de estandarización de las cuales eh, John Petty es, es parte y también está eh, activamente participando. Yo también eh, tengo el honor de platicarles que estamos en diferentes organizaciones como la ITA 3D, como Immersed, que es un evento de realidad virtual que hacemos a nivel mundial. También tenemos el VR Council o el Consejo de Realidad Virtual Mundial y el DTG Roundtable y finalmente el VR Society. En todas estas eh, iniciativas son diferentes, pero todas tienen la misión de estandarizar el formato que se va a utilizar finalmente de realidad virtual. Sin un formato estandarizado, sin un estándar, va a ser muy complicado poder tener eh, interoperabilidad y con tantos proveedores y con tantas técnicas se convierte en un reto. So, uh, John Petty and I are, uh, are proud to be part of many different uh, standardization organizations like the ITA 3D in MERS, where we have uh, many uh, virtual reality events around the world. 
um, VR Council, which is uh, composed by the top five uh, head-mounted display manufacturers, including uh, our company, Immersion Brelia. And um, we also have uh, the DTG Roundtable, which is a standardization for broadcast and studios. And kind of, uh, you can see the logos there of all the different companies that are participating on the standardization. You can see in the upper corner. And the VR Society, which is a new uh, initiative also for high quality content standardization. Then we talk about the camera quality. You're going to find a lot of quality differences on different cameras. There are many 360 cameras around there. There are the, the circular, the, the spherical, the cylindrical. There are the ones that have two lenses, four lenses, six lenses, nine lenses, 12 lenses, 16 lenses. They are always a challenge. You need to find the right one depending on the content that you're uh, capturing. We can find cameras that are very low cost. And then we can find cameras that are like super extreme high cost, but the quality is on parallel. Now, clearly, there has to be something for the consumer, and there has to be something for the professional side. Nos vamos a encontrar con el reto de que necesitamos que las cámaras también estén estandarizadas. Y además encontramos que hay una gran variedad de cámaras de diferentes tipos que van desde dos lentes, un lente, tres lentes, seis lentes, nueve lentes, doce, dieciséis lentes. Y vamos a encontrar que diferentes precios también se van a encontrar en, en, esta, eh, en, este, en este rango de cámaras. Entonces se convierte también en un reto saber qué cámara uso. Bueno, pues depende de la aplicación, depende de la experiencia, depende del presupuesto, depende de qué tan grande va a ser la calidad que quieres entregar a tus usuarios finales. Si es cinematic experience o experiencia de cine, o si es una end user experience, que sería el usuario común. Oh. Okay. Oh, there. Okay. Después tenemos eh, la contribución de contenido. Aquí es muy importante porque el contenido que se genera para realidad virtual puede venir de múltiples lugares. Puede venir de contenido generado por computadora, o puede ser contenido de video. Pueden ser videojuegos, pueden ser ambientes generados por computadora, o puede ser una mezcla de las dos. ¿Eh? Entonces, aquí tenemos que todos los diferentes contribuidores de contenido tendrán que trabajar en hacer lo mejor posible dentro de su área de expertise. Si van a generar contenido, tendrán que generarlo de la mejor calidad. So then we have the challenge of the content contribution in the ecosystem. The content contribution can be computer generated content, it can be video content, it can be a mix of both. It can be a game, it can be an app, it can be an experience, it can be real time, or it can be offline. So all these challenges bring a new set of variables to the table that need to be addressed as part of the entire standardization and challenges that this new industry is facing. And then there come the deployment platforms. There are many ways to bring the, the content to the public. And you can find the Oculus Home Store, or you can find the Alter Space. Uh, you can find many other ways to deploy content to the mass market. Uh, they all have different types or challenges. They have different characteristics. They have different monetization methods. Some of them are free. Some of them are uh, you know, with a cost. Some of them are by subscription, by download, by experience. Uh, or some levels are free, and then you start charging. So all these platforms are also there, and they represent also another step on the challenges. Y luego vienen las plataformas de, de entrega, ¿no? Vamos a encontrar con que tenemos plataformas de entrega que son como el Oculus Home, o como YouTube, o como el Alter Space, y todas son diferentes. Todas tendrán sus propias características, su propio mercado, su propia aplicación. En el caso de las diferentes eh, plataformas que encontramos, eh, veremos que hay retos interesantes eh, que resolver, ¿no? Eh, algunos son gratis, algunos son de cobro, algunos son de pago, de suscripción, pago por download, pago por experiencia. Algunos niveles van a ser gratis, otros van a ser eh, cobrados, algunos van a ser eh, privados, donde no va a poder ver y van a ser únicamente de una empresa, ¿no? Y finalmente tenemos el espectrum de aplicaciones de Head Mounted Display y la visualización. En el caso de la visualización, nos encontramos con un espectro muy grande que va desde el Google Cardboard. Levante la mano a los que han visto el Google Cardboard. OK, bien. Desde el Google Cardboard hasta el HTC Vive o el Prodigy One, pasando por una serie de diferentes eh, aparatos de todas marcas y de todo tipo y de todo costo. 
Esto, bueno, nos ubica en, en un mapa que algunos van a requerir más poder de procesamiento, sobre todo los que son tethered, van a requerir un poco más de procesamiento gráfico, requiere una computadora más grande, con más tarjeta gráfica, con más memoria, con más disco duro. Y por el otro lado, los Google Cardboard que funcionan con cualquier teléfono y que dependiendo del teléfono es tu experiencia, si es muy grande, si es muy bueno, si es muy rápido, si no, esa es la experiencia. So finally we have the display visualization method and the display visualization method goes in a spectrum that goes from the Google Cardboard all the way to the high end like uh, Blue Sky Pro, Vive, Oculus, Prodigy One and many others. Uh, and it starts from the Google Cardboard, the Gear VR, the Oculus, the PlayStation VR Morpheus. So you will find a lot of variety on the head mounted displays. They all have a different set of requirements. So high end Uh, devices require a high-end computing power. They require a higher graphics uh, memory, higher graphics processing GPUs. They require a higher uh, platform for develop deployment, some of them. And then in the low end, we have the Google Cardboard and many other uh, head-mounted displays that are based on a smartphone. And of course, the experience is going to be limited or ruled by the actual smartphone that you're using. So. Now I'm going to uh, invite uh, Caitlin because uh, this is important. Uh, no, yeah, come in, come in, come on. So uh, there, is, there are many challenges that need to be addressed for the key factors of mass adoption. So we have, uh, in my conclusion, they have to be universal. The majority of the devices have to be universal. They have to be agnostic, which means that they should work on pretty much any platform. Uh, they have to be accessible for the public because if you have to invest $3,000 to join the virtual reality uh, environment, that's going to be a high expense. And they also have to be seamless for the user. And by seamless, I mean that creating content and publishing the content has to be something easy. Ya para finalizar mi parte y para pasarle el micrófono a Caitlin, yo considero que para que realidad virtual sea adoptada en forma masiva, necesitamos que sea universal, o sea que funcione en cualquier dispositivo, necesitamos que sea agnóstica, que funcione en cualquier plataforma eh, de hardware, necesitamos que sea accesible, porque no, no o sea, es muy difícil pensar que tenemos la cantidad de recursos para comprar una computadora de 3 mil dólares o más el, más el aparato, más el device, tiene que ser accesible a todo el mundo para realmente hacerlo más adoption. Y después tiene que ser interoperable para que podamos intercambiar entre diferentes plataformas y finalmente que sea transparente al usuario. Y para que sea transparente al usuario, tiene que ser muy fácil hacer un drag and drop con plugins desde sistemas y ambientes de realidad virtual o hacia ambientes de realidad virtual. Es decir, se genera el contenido y que sea fácil exportarlo para disfrutar la experiencia o que podamos este, intercambiar plataformas de contenido. Y de eso nos va a hablar mucho este, Caitlin. Caitlin, now your turn, about uh, computer generated graphics and how the plugins and the interaction between different platforms has to be there for computer graphics, okay? Thanks so much, Manuel. Okay. You want me to translate for you? Or in Spanish? Okay, you, you, you cue me, okay? Oh. So hi, I'm Kathleen Marr and I work with uh, John Petty mostly on the software side. So I kind of wanted to wrap up a lot of the stuff we were talking about from the point of view of content creation. I'm so happy to be here. This is like, this is like the burning man for technology or something. It, you guys are creating this marvelous community that involves hardware, software, programming, IoT, all these things that, and they all sort of bubble into VR. So I think this is really exciting. Lo que comenta Caitlin es que hay una serie de retos muy grandes en lo que es la parte de generación de, de contenido por computadora, donde hay diferentes plataformas que se pueden utilizar para generar eh, environments dentro de realidad virtual. Es todo un reto y de eso nos va a hablar Caitlin. So, um, so as, as, uh, as we know, content is completely king when it comes to VR. We're in this sort of nascent period that it's just growing up. And if the content is terrible, it's going to take a lot more time for uh, VR to catch hold. I will say, though, that I don't think there's much doubt that VR is going to happen. 
and that it's going to be around for a long time. But there are a lot of challenges for it to be ultimately long-term mass market successful, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit now. The, um, what, do you want to take? So one of, the, um, one of the things we're seeing in these early days is that um, like the, the people that have been involved in content creation all along are of course jumping on board, why not? And, uh, and I, you know, Autodesk, Adobe, the foundry's just uh, turning up with uh, uh, new tools. Who else did I say? Assimilate, Blender's coming up with great stuff. But also we're seeing the rise of game engines because gaming is expected to be one of the biggest markets and thus the game engines are uh, more than happy to leap in as well. What's interesting is that we're seeing the game engines get very interested in some of the uh, territory that the traditional content creation software companies have been in. So there's going to be a little bit of clash as the uh, game engine companies try to take on more and more of the duties that the uh, traditional content creation software companies think that they should uh, rightly own. Finally, we're going to see uh, we're seeing these new little companies sort of point-based, bubbling up, uh, taking care of some of the difficult problems that are uh, peculiar to uh, VR. And that, and that such as stitching, making the drivers for the hardware, compositing, audio, et cetera. These companies, of course, are going to be the ones that will be primed for acquisition. So, so it's a rough place to be, but it, it could be a very lucrative place to be as well. So, oh, sorry. It's okay, no problem. So what lo que estaba menciona Kathleen es que hay una serie de participantes en el en la generación de contenido, eh, como podemos ver, que son normalmente utilizados para generar contenidos virtuales, no son contenidos virtuales, sino contenidos con, generados por computadora como Autodesk, Unity que se utiliza mucho para generar videojuegos, Adobe que se utiliza para la edición de, de videos eh, y diferentes game engines que también sirven para generar juegos normales en 2D. Bueno, ahora hay un interés muy grande de todos los participantes que generan este tipo de contenido por migrar y dar el paso a realidad virtual. Entonces hay muchas cosas o factores que están inciertos y que se tienen que ir resolviendo poco a poco y que tendrá que haber nuevas herramientas. Ya hay muchas herramientas allá afuera, muchos goodies allá afuera en el GitHub que se pueden encontrar con diferentes herramientas para el stitching, para el patching, para la edición y poco a poco vamos a ir viendo más. Pero sí existe una necesidad de proporcionarle a los usuarios interesados las herramientas para pasar de aquí a realidad virtual. I'm so glad Manuel has such a good memory. <laughs> so with the summation of all this, of course, is there's huge holes in the pipeline of creation, which is, which is one of the places where the opportunities are going to come. And that's very exciting. Go ahead. Tenemos un pipeline que hay que llenar, digamos, que es una, un flujo de información en el roadmap o en el workflow y que tiene muchos hoyos y que se tienen que llenar. Esos hoyos se llenan con plugins, se llenan con add-ons, se llenan con diferentes técnicas. So I want to give you this uh, chart. Of, these, are, these are the market shares of the major segments of content creation. I think one of the things that's important to remember is that like, while we all love entertainment and games and they seem like the sort of monster uh, markets, when it comes to the content creation, that isn't necessarily where the money is. As you can see, the CAD CAM manufacturing is, is huge. When you get into content creation software, uh, those companies make considerably less money. The people who work, who work in that content creation make less money. You, some of you have probably already experienced that. But, um, and so, so CAD CAM is like in the six, seven, eight billion dollars. In contrast, when you get into uh, 3D modeling and animation and uh, video, you're talking about, and, and imaging, you're talking in the millions, high millions, but uh, uh, you're talking about considerably smaller markets. So, one of the things we're seeing in VR is a great deal of opportunity coming up from these older traditional markets like CAD CAM and uh, manufacturing, AEC architecture where, where uh, VR is coming into play for visualization as it has been used traditionally, except that VR can add so much more richness 
via immersion. Como podemos ver en esta gráfica de Pi, el mercado se distribuye en diferentes aplicaciones de CAD CAM, que es una de las más grandes. Después tenemos video digital. Está segmentado, vemos modelación, animación, vemos diferentes simulaciones y también vemos eh, vectores de, imaginación, de, de imagenología. Eh, todo esto son diferentes participantes de la industria y para todo esto se va a requerir direccionar los recursos de realidad virtual para que puedan accesarlo y portar toda esta información hacia allá. Los mercados son enormes, estamos hablando de billones de dólares para cada una de estas industrias, por lo tanto el potencial de desarrollo, el potencial de generación, el potencial de negocio es muy grande en estas nuevas áreas de realidad virtual. So, uh, so one of the things that I wanted to um, highlight, and it comes from that last slide as well, is that there are huge opportunities But I think that uh, it's going to be a surprise as this market evolves because it, it, there will be opportunities in not necessarily the um, sort of high profile gaming and entertainment. I think that's going to take a little longer to mature and to uh, reveal itself basically how, how people are really going to want to play games, how people are really going to want to see a, a story. But uh, some of the more traditional, like uh, designing, you're already in 3D, AEC, architecture design, they're already using walkthroughs. So those are, in some ways, easier markets to make the transition and easier opportunities. Algunos, eh, lo que comenta Kathleen, es oh, que... Al... I made it hard. <laughs> <laughs> you're fast. Uh, what, lo que está mencionando Kathleen es que Así como vemos las diferentes aplicaciones eh, que hay en los mercados, algunos de estos mercados probablemente no son lo que nos esperamos. Por ejemplo, en el caso de la generación de contenido de video, lo que se le llama el storytelling o el cómo contar la historia, cambia muchísimo de la forma convencional a la forma de realidad virtual. Entonces, se tiene que replantear, se tiene que reimaginar esta forma de generar contenido. Hacer una película en 2D, ya no es lo mismo que hacer una película en realidad virtual. Se tiene que reimaginar el proceso, se tiene que reimaginar cómo se va a direccionar. Ya estamos hablando de una cámara que ve todo alrededor, ya no hay camarógrafos, ya no hay productores, ya no hay luces. Es diferente. Lo mismo sucede con los videojuegos. No todo el mundo quiere estar en primera persona, no todo el mundo quiere estar en tercera persona observando cómo se desempeña un videojuego. Entonces, se tiene que replantear un poco cómo se van a generar los contenidos de realidad virtual, eh, entre otras cosas. So the challenges, I think we've covered pretty well in this talk today. Manuel's covered them as well as John a little bit. But uh, as we said, there's a lack of standards. And the standards we're seeing in content creation is all those uh, companies I talked about in the first slide are not particularly easy, uh, eager to make things easy for uh, their competitors. So transferring content between the different platforms and the different programs has, has remains a challenge. Uh, The, uh, there are the, inf the uh, aforementioned holes in the uh, pipeline, and what we're seeing there is that people are sort of, uh, they're building their own tools, and sometimes they're building them over and over again, and that's not going to uh, enable people to make money. Making money is a big problem. It's unsure who's going to pay for a lot of these small cardboard applications, or who's really going to pay to see a promo for a movie. Will the movie studios continue to fund those types of applications. So, um, what else was I gonna say? And, um, oh, was it rude to mention clunky hardware? It, it's obvious to go over this uh, again and again, but you, if you've got something that makes somebody sick, you don't really have a good market, a go-to-market plan. So, and, uh, oh, and the dangerous hype cycle. As I say, I do think that, um, VR is here to stay, but I think there's a real danger of over-enthusiasm, a lot of uh, applications that are not good enough, a lot of content that's not good enough, and then, and then sort of there'll be a uh, backlash and uh, that's going to slow down the progress of more mainstream applications. Also, we really do have to see the hardware catch up so that it becomes more invisible. Uh, we, saw, we saw stereographic movies hit a roadblock because finally there, there is a subset of people that sort of balk at headwear. We're going to have to deal with that so, same sort of challenge uh, in VR. I do think that these challenges are uh, rapidly being dealt with, 
and uh, with incredibly creative hardware. Wrap it up. Okay. Okay. So I want you to think about sort of the short term and the long term opportunities. There, as I said, there are things that are. Um, you're just gonna have to do it all. <laughs> so, so uh, in, in terms of the short, short term, we're seeing cardboard, we're seeing mobile VR, we're seeing very easy to make apps and easy to consume and free. But in the long term, and this is what is actually really hopeful, is that there, there are new types of content that are being created. And that's again why I bring up this sort of burning man of technology because this new platform and these new communities that are being invented at places like this are going to make entirely new types of medium that will last for generations. And I'm so sorry, I'm not used to having a partner and such a good one too. It's okay, no, no, it's okay. Uh, Kathleen estaba mencionando que efectivamente hay muchos retos en los estándares, como habíamos mencionado antes, y que hay retos que están en el corto plazo y hay, hay retos que están en el largo plazo. Entonces, habrá que direccionar algunos, habrá que irse con mucho cuidado. No es un mercado que podamos dar por seguro, tenemos que reinventar muchas cosas. Va a haber una transición, va a haber un proceso de adopción, donde vamos a empezar con algunas experiencias de, de, digamos de, de mobile VR, o sea, que son on, eh, on tether y que son basadas en teléfono móvil. Y después vamos a ir subiendo en la parte de eh, profesionalización o qué tan profesional es el contenido. Hay muchos retos de hardware, en su lámina pasada, para mencionarlo, existe un reto de actualizar el hardware que está allá afuera, porque no todo el hardware es bueno. Si algo que te estás poniendo te marea es porque no es bueno. Entonces habrá que pensar en buscar el hardware adecuado para que la experiencia sea la adecuada. Entonces todos estos son los retos que menciona Caitlin y ahorita va a presentar algunos recursos de utilidad para ustedes si quieren tomar un screenshot. So I, I put up a few, uh, just a few sort of uh, sites that you might look at for more information. There's tons more and we'll put a lot more up on our site. So, um, so please do go and uh, check, it, check it out and see what's going on there. Thanks so much for coming. And uh, we'll have John and Manuel back up so you guys can ask questions. We have uh, just a few minutes left. If you have any questions, now's the time for them. Wow. Well, whatever language you choose. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. So uh, an emerging field of research is the, the augmented reality. Are you working in the file and research right now? Well, we, uh, we're following that market very closely. Um, it's, it's a totally different market. and. Uh, he thinks he's going to bridge the two together, we'll see, but uh, augmented reality is just what it says. I, would, I could be using augmented reality now, be here with you and getting information. But virtual reality takes me away from you. I have, to, I have to go away from you to experience virtual reality. And so they're two dramatically different paradigms. And like I said, he thinks he can blend it, we'll see. Bien, hay muchos retos que resolver, eh, lo, que, lo que comentamos es, y la pregunta eh, que hizo él, eh, la respuesta es que hay muchos retos que resolver hay, para que sea, se convierta en un mainstream, eh, hay muchos huecos que llenar, y he estado bromeando, nosotros, es, eh, no, nosotros en nuestra empresa Immersion Relay vamos a llenar todos esos huecos para hacer que todo el mundo pueda utilizar realidad virtual y pueda utilizarlo en cualquier plataforma y en cualquier computadora en forma interoperable. Esa es la visión de nuestra compañera, no, no quise hacer mucha publicidad, pero de eso se trata nuestra empresa. Y la otra cosa que quería añadir es que la cosa interesante sobre augmented reality es que muchos de los modelos de negocio son más viejos y más establecidos en términos de los mercados tradicionales que estábamos hablando, en términos de la manufactura, la training, ese tipo de cosas. Uh, so, so in some ways, we'll see that stuff happen a lot faster, and and there are even more mature tools. So, well, I have actually two questions. So, one is when you put the slide where there were all the companies that were involved in the standard in the in in the standard uh, councils and, and so on. I didn't see, for instance, Envis, so which is a company that builds HMDs. So it's just curiosity, so I didn't see it. I don't know if it's there or not. No, it should be there. There, should, there are a lot of companies, we just, you know. Okay. Envis. So, what company? Envis. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, John says he has to look at his spreadsheet. That, that is sort of okay. it. Okay. <laughs> so, and the second question is, so there was a slide where you put all the chart, and I saw that 2% of animation and modeling. I don't know if you, there was included there the motion capture or not, because motion capture is also well related with virtual reality, and they are doing very well. For instance, XMs, OptiTrack, and they're doing quite a lot of money. Mm -hmm. One of the... Yeah, uh, you're right, of course, but uh, one of the things uh, I should say, of course, is that the, the, there are companies doing well in all those segments and will do well, but in term, they're dwarfed in terms of the larger, uh, say, CAD CAM markets and that sort of thing. So uh, uh, motion capture and uh, even newer scanning technologies could be in there too. And, um, and depending on which one I was talking about, they still will be smaller compared to those huge old traditional markets in terms of just dollars. So, anybody, any other questions? Hello. Hi. Uh, where, where do you see the differences in VR adoptions or technology adoptions between North America and Latin America? I think um, we were arguing about that just <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen is absolutely convinced that Mexico is the emerging country uh, and I don't disagree with that but it'll take a little time to catch up to the established country so probably the initial adoption will be in uh, traditional industrialized countries like the United States Canada and, and Western Europe uh, they will be superseded very, very quickly within a year by China. And then will come the, what I will call the secondary countries like, <laughs> like uh, Mexico, South America, and uh, India and other parts like that. So I'd say probably uh, there's, there's a magic number when you're talking about consumer uh, adoption, and it's called the 20% number. When 20% of the households do something, whether it's a television or fax machine or washing machine or whatever, when you hit that magic number, then you say that you have consumer adoption. I would say that in the case of the countries we've talked about, uh, United States and Western Europe will see consumer adoption of virtual reality pretty close to the middle to the end of 2017, reset, 2018. China will probably be maybe one year behind that, and Mexico one or two years behind that. 2020? Yeah, about that. Bueno, esa fue la respuesta de, de John. Yo voy a agregar un poco algo en español eh, y después en inglés eh, para contestar esa pregunta. Precisamente lo que queremos hacer es que ese gap o esa diferencia de adopción entre Estados Unidos y Latinoamérica se reduzca. Creemos que hay suficiente creatividad y muchísimas ganas de aprender y salir adelante en la parte de realidad virtual en Latinoamérica. Y de hecho uno de nuestros propósitos que tenemos por ahí en una de nuestras compañías es hacer que Guadalajara, por ejemplo, se convierta en el centro de realidad virtual de todo Latinoamérica. Y eso es nuestra misión para este año. Esperamos recortar el gap y que al rato vayamos hasta más rápido. ¿eh? <laughs> bueno, uh, now I want to say it in English so they understand. So what I was saying is that um, there is a gap between the adoption of the United States and Latin America. But actually, one of the missions of our companies we have here in Merchant Rally and others is that we want to short that gap. We want to accelerate in such a way that we go as fast or faster than the United States. All right? <laughs> we look forward to it. <laughs> so I think we're going to get booted off the stage. We have, what? So if there's no more questions, I'll show you a quick video that uh, NVIDIA brought over. They were supposed to be here to do this, not me, but I'll do it. Uh, and what NVIDIA did is they took a tool set that they've developed and created a uh, game. This is just a little uh, video that shows what the game is. Uh, the guys that they're going to be talking are the guys from Go uh, Mythbusters. I don't know if you've ever seen the TV series Mythbusters. they experimenting with hyper-realistic physics engines, so I'm about to go see what they're working on. Hello, Adam. Hello. 
Rev, how's it going? Good, good. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, what we're going to show you is uh, what we call VR Funhouse. It's our newest game. It's essentially a sandbox for testing out the various types of physics that we've been developing over the years inside this virtual reality space. You guys gave me a chance to play around in your fun house. The physics, which is the main point of this demo, is amazing. That is really cool. For the most part, it's operating the way I would expect things to operate within the world. I've played around with games that have their own physics engines, and for this to have genuine physics that you can work with, that gets me really going. Oh! I love the swords, specifically the metal reflectivity. That had a tremendous effect on making it feel really real. We have a turbulent simulation, so when you wave the swords around in the air, you can see the confetti swirling around. Excessive latency can make people sick and specifically make me sick. I have a very weak stomach. I did this for two hours, I didn't have any problem. Do you want to stop and rest? I'm good to keep playing. All right. The latency was low enough and the, the frame rate was high enough that I felt locked into the space. Dude, I liked shooting at the plates. I can hold up the gun and get the sights correct on the target. I love the fact that as I shoot the pottery and it's coming towards me, the particles after I shoot it come towards me and are still on the ground and I can still shoot them. You're welcome to use both guns. I think my favorite thing though was the squirt guns. Specifically, when I realized I didn't have to shoot all the way in the air, I could actually adjust the flow. I even notice as I bring the streams together, you guys have built surface tension into the liquid. Yes. I can squirt one stream through another and start to see them interact with each other. There's viscosity and surface Yeah, tension. that's freaking cool. I'm somewhat familiar with how much computational muscle it takes to model hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of pieces of things as they're exploding and dropping around you. To see the photorealistic stuff that you guys are generating now happening live in front of me, it beggars the imagination how much processing you're doing in the back. The haptic feedback is really critical, and I'm totally clear that it's one of the toughest problems to solve. There's some tension. Uh-huh. The handles did this great job of giving me different kinds of vibration uh, to give me a, a feeling of different things that were happening. Oh my god, I can feel... That's really awesome. This is better than anything I've seen in terms of the physics of being able to manipulate the world that I'm immersed in. Oh, I could totally get addicted to this. You mentioned you had some ideas on how we can make our game better. I thought the swords were just a little bit rudimentary. The blade you have, if you cut it in a cross section, would be like diamond shaped. It's more realistic to have what's called a hollow grind in which the diamond shape, the slopes of the diamond are actually concave. What we really want to do is inspire others to create similar sorts of experiences. So we decided to put out all of the source code and all of the assets for this game to the general public as open source so that they can modify it and make those kinds of changes themselves. Maybe we can scan some stuff from my shop and Absolutely. Put it in. Okay, good, good. Rev, thank you so much for letting me play in your sandbox. Thank you for coming and experiencing this with us. That was awesome. Just going to give you uh three closing points. Uh, number one, that uh, it's ex ex essential, it's absolutely critical that we be able to see our hands in virtual reality and hopefully our feet as well. Uh, if you have to be remote from yourself in virtual reality, that's going to keep some people from enjoying it. Second point is uh, sound, audio, is absolutely critical also. You have to have genuine 360 sound so that you can hear things coming from behind you and going elsewhere. And third point, and then I'll let you guys get out of here, is that uh, AMD also has a set of tools and software development uh, examples, just like NVIDIA does, and Intel is developing one also, and Qualcomm has one as well. So you have a lot of choice of free tools that you can use to create your virtual reality content if you choose to do that. Go home. <laughs> Llega la tercera edición de Una Idea para cambiar.